All right, we've come now to the uh, book of Romans, which <clears throat> is many people's favorite. It's probably my favorite book. And like many other uh, people, my favorite chapter is the eighth chapter. So it's a shame not to be able to spend more time in the book than we can spend today. But let's look at the historical background. <clears throat> First of all, it was written by Paul, and it was written from Corinth in A.D. 57. The epistle to the Romans was occasioned by Paul's plan to visit the church at Rome. Um, get that from Acts chapter 19. He wrote partly to solicit support for his plans to take the gospel to, do you know where? What European country? Spain. He had plans to go to Spain, and we really don't know whether he ever made it there or not. Some think he did. Uh, but we don't have anything to prove it. Primarily to affirm and establish the Roman believers in the apostolic teaching of God's plan of salvation for Gentiles as well as for Jews. And just at the outset, let me say that we need to teach the doctrine of salvation to believers. It's not just uh, something that unbelievers need to hear, but believers need to understand. Uh, it is evident from Romans 1.13 and chapter 15, verse 22, that Paul had been hindered on more than one occasion from visiting Rome, where he had several friends. How the church in Rome was established is unknown. A good guess, <clears throat> since people from Rome are mentioned as having occasion, having come to the Feast at Pentecost in Jerusalem, that some were saved probably under the preaching of Peter at Pentecost and went back to Rome and that that may be how the church started. But we really don't know for sure. Most of the other churches, we have an idea of how they started. Literary analysis, uh, Romans is mostly didactic, D-I-D-A-C-T-I-C, -I -C, didactic material, means teaching, rich in a variety of lit literary devices, including dialogue and parallelism. <clears throat> you can read this quote by Gradinus. Uh, the blank there is debating, Hellenistic debating style. Number three, uh, he further observes that Romans 4.25 is a good example of the antithetic parallelism, A-N-T-I. T-H-E-T-I-C, antithetic parallelism. And that's just another observation about a literary device in which you say one thing and it's opposed to another. Antithetic, T-H-E-T-I-C. So, debating style. So, you know, synthetic parallelism or synonymous parallelism is a literary device where you say the same thing either to complete the first thought or to say the same thing in a different way. Antithetical is where you contrast thoughts. Who was put to death for our trespasses but raised for our justification? So by putting those together, you have the contrast accentuated. <clears throat> now, Romans is clearly and carefully laid out in such a way as to set forth the good news of how the righteousness of God is needed by all. Needed by all kinds of men. It is imputed through faith. And it is imparted, that is, it is made available by the Holy Spirit. Consistent with God's program for Israel, past, present, and future, <clears throat> and lived out in service. So that's a long sentence. It's an attempt to try to flesh out the entire book. It's the righteousness of God. Everybody needs it. Gentile, Jew. How do you get it? By faith. How do you realize it? By the Spirit's impartation of it. And all of that is in keeping with what God was doing with Israel, and it's all ultimately for <clears throat> or lived out in service. Douglas Moo, while calling the book a treatise or a tractate, states that Romans is far from being a comprehensive summary of Paul's theology. In other words, Paul did not sit down one day and say, I think I'll write my systematic theology. 
and I'll call it Romans. He's, he's writing to a church with a purpose in which he expresses, uh, let's write in there, a general theological argument <clears throat> or a series of arguments. Are we good with blank so far? Yeah. All right. It emphasizes the very first blank. Paul. All kinds of men. All. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Now, it, it, Paul's letter, emphasizes the power of the gospel. <clears throat> I'll just read that verse. I'm looking right at it. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Um, then it emphasizes the depravity of man. Depravity doesn't mean everyone is as bad as they could be, but it does mean that every aspect of human nature has been infected by sin. And Paul brings, that is a doctrine that you can uh, support very easily from that first chapter. Okay, the universal need of God's righteousness. Universal mean, meaning that everybody needs it. And then the importance and adequacy of faith in appropriating God's righteousness. On page 19 at the top, the principles, problems, and power of holy living. And really chapter 6 gives us the principles for holy living. Chapter 7, the problems. And chapter 8, the power. Holy living, okay? Number two, I, I uh, it concludes Roman being number two on a theological understanding. It's had a part, at its part, a, a general, general theologi- theological argument. No. And then the last thing is the practice of righteousness in chapters 12 through 15. So the book's very, very well laid out. It's about one thing, the righteousness of God. And uh, it's really one of the more difficult books to wrap around all the depth of the theology that's in it, but not hard to see the outline. So in the introduction... Excuse me, Dr. Garland, we missed one right above the practice of righteousness. God's sovereignty over you. You know what? I don't think I said that. Thank you. God's sovereignty over Israel's temporary rejection and future restoration. Thank you. Now, I'm tipping my hand again, and not everyone agrees with me that uh, Israel's rejection is temporary. Some people teach what is called replacement theology and think that the church has intercepted, for uh, one way to put it, the promises made to Israel and that there is no future for Israel, only a past. But I think we'll see clearly in Romans 9, 10, and 11 that uh, God has a future plan for Israel. So the first blank is introduction. <laughs> and that's the first 17 verses which culminate in that... One day is coming. The practice of righteousness. All right, now introduction. The key verse verses are 16 and 17. And I just read 16. Let me go on with 17. For in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So the things that I would write in those three blanks are first gospel, then the righteousness of God, 
and then faith. And the key question that that answers is, what is the gospel? That's really what he wrote to clarify. What is the gospel? And we know that the word gospel, euangelion, means good announcement or the good news. And uh, so in a sense, his answer is it's the good news of Christ by which the righteousness of God is received by faith. But you don't need to write that in there. So, that's foundational to everything that follows. Everything that follows kind of grows out of that, that opening uh, foundation. The second major point there of chapters 118 through 320 is the need for God's righteousness. <clears throat> he brings out the fact that it's needed by the Gentiles, which is all non-Jews. But it's also needed by the Jews. And it's needed finally by everybody because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's so many things I want to say from chapter 1. <laughs> but um, One thing I just want to point out, and I, I say this hopefully with gentleness and a certain amount of um, empathy. <clears throat> but in verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to vile passions. God gave them over to a debased mind, in verse 28. Homosexuality, as a practice, is a judgment. God's the one that gave people to it as a result of their refusal to honor him as a creator and to appreciate the natural function of the woman and of the man. And if you read this, uh, carefully, it is a judgment that God gave them over to. And I think a lot of people miss that. Yeah. Uh, chapter 2, um, the goodness of God leads you to repentance is an interesting statement. And in, uh, I don't know, just in my experience, I, I don't always think of how... I should be brought to my knees and brought to an awareness of my need for God just on the basis of his goodness to me. But that's found there in verse uh, 4. Hard for me to see the verse numbers in my Bible, but verse 4. There's no partiality with God, verse 11. Um, The the Gentile or the non-Jew who doesn't have the law of Moses has the law written on their hearts. Their conscience bearing witness with them. Verse 15 of chapter 2. So, in a way, God's revelation is in creation. As he says in chapter 1, you can look at creation and draw some accurate conclusions about God's greatness and his existence. There's revelation of God in the human conscience that everyone is born with a certain sense of right and wrong that is innate. And that becomes something that every person naturally dishonors as evidence of the fact that they're a sinner. And then the Jews are guilty. In spite of all the privileges that they've been given, they uh, fail to live up to the law that they have. And uh, they sometimes pride themselves, or they did in circumcision or outward signs or rites that they thought showed that they were privileged and that they uh, had favor with God. And he makes the point that um, first of all he is a Jew who is one inwardly so circumcision is just an outward thing and if the inward reality isn't there it's just like being baptized when you're not really saved it doesn't, doesn't merit anything so by the time he comes to chapter 3 his point is that everybody is in need of salvation or the righteousness of God put to their account because none is righteous <clears throat> 
verse 9, he says, Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already or previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. Verse 20 of chapter 3, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. This is very similar to what Paul said in Galatians about the law being a tutor to bring us to Christ. So we come to that very well-known verse in chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that falling short is the idea of a person who takes an a, a arrow and a, and a bow and draws it back and points it at a target. And he might be dead on as far as this way or that way. You know, this way or that way. His arrow is right on center, but it just doesn't quite get to the target. It falls short. Your arrow went further than my arrow. That's good, except that it doesn't matter because you missed it too. We all fall short. And that, that's a very important uh, passage in theology and in our understanding of human nature and our need for salvation. But it doesn't stop there. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Um, verse 26 talks about Christ being the just and the justifier, or, or God being the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. He's just in that he doesn't wink at sin. He doesn't lower his standard. In, in my uh, college course, I've used the illustration of a pole vault or a high jump. You know, he doesn't lower the bar and say that just anybody then can step over it as a means of saving people. But it, neither does he put the bar, bar up there and then just watch us all fall short and try, try to jump high enough or pole vault high enough and get over it. He maintains his justice by keeping the bar up there, his standard of righteousness. But then in the person of his son, he sails over that bar, clears it by a mile, and gives to us the benefit or the, the merit that he achieved by his, his uh, fulfillment of the law. That's how God is just. He didn't lower the standard. And how he's the justifier, he met the standard in the person of his son. And I think those are great uh, kind of things to keep in mind, word pictures to illustrate that. So that man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Verse 30, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. So it's by faith in it, no matter which case. Chapter 4, Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him as righteousness. I'm looking at verse 3. Accounted to him is the Logizomai in the Greek has the idea of logging or putting to the account of. And this is a, a bookkeeper's entry so that Abraham didn't earn or deserve righteousness, but God imputed it put, to it, put it to his account. He logged it into his ledger so that it's, it's as if God went to the filing cabinet and looked up and found Abraham in his file and pulled it out uh, or me, for that matter, or you. He wouldn't see all of my sins and unrighteous deeds, but he would see there that those had been expunged and in their place had been put all the righteousness of Christ. Put to the account of is what the idea of uh, accounted to him for righteousness means. It's a legal standing. And I'm so thankful it doesn't depend on my faithfulness, but his, his faithfulness. Um, I'm just trying to pick up some things that will keep this thread of thought going um, or or show the thread that's here. Abraham is said in verse 11 to be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed to them also. So his argument is that we're saved the same way Abraham was. And Abraham preceded the law by 1,500 years, or by 500 years. And uh, his point is that no one has ever been saved by keeping the law. That's not the purpose for which the law was given. Okay. So the key question there was, who needs righteousness? And the answer is, 
was everybody. If you're with me. Actually, I'm way, way up there at the end of uh, that second section. After it says universal guilt, then there's a key question. Who needs righteousness? Everybody. When we come to chapter, chapters 3 to 5 there that we are in talking right now, it's imputation of God's righteousness. The imputation, like input. Well, it's not input, but imputation of God's righteousness in the example of Abraham. And here's a key verse as we come to chapter 5. <clears throat> verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you wouldn't have to, because, you know, and I'm not, you're not going to turn these notes into me, but you're going to be answering questions at the end of this section, based on your notes. So whether you want to write that in there now or just later, it's just the, the words of chapter 5, verse 1. Notice it says, having been justified by faith. Justification isn't something the believer looks forward to, but rests in. Has, we have it now. And as a consequence, we have peace with God. The peace of God that Paul talks about in Philippians is a, an experience that we may or may not have, depending on whether we are making our requests known to God with thanksgiving. But peace with God is His doing, and we have it through Jesus Christ. So the key question there is, how do I receive righteousness? And the answer is by faith. Now, chapter 6 through 8 is the impartation of God's righteousness. Impartation. If I've got this righteousness as a standing legally before God in heaven, how do I make use of it? How do I realize it in everyday living or in my walk with God? And the first thing he does in chapter 6 is speak of principles of holy living. And of course, the first part of chapter 6, he deals with baptism as a picture of our uh, death with Christ to sin and our resurrection with him to newness of life. And on the basis of the reality that his death was our death, and that his resurrection is the basis for our having new life, he says in verse 11, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The principle of holy living is to believe that what God says is true about you is true that you have a new life, that your old life, as we said yesterday from Galatians, has been circumcised, the defiled flesh has been cut away, and you have a, you're a new creature in Christ, you're, you're dead to sin but alive to, to Christ. If you believed that, and if I did, and we acted in accordance with that belief, we wouldn't really have a problem with holy living. So he says to, uh, in verse 13, present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. So as I understand chapter 6, he's simply saying, believe what is positionally true of you is true. Count on it. Act on it as as a fact. He talks about giving your members, you know, that used to be weapons of unrighteousness, but present them so that they're uh, instruments of righteousness. Now, chapter 7 is the problems of holy living. When I try to do that, Paul, I run into a snag, and he did too. And that is the very things he wants to do, he doesn't do, and the things he doesn't want to do, he does do. And so he realizes he contends with something in his body, or at least associated with his body. It's not his body, but it's called the flesh. And I see it as a principle of sin. That's hard to... It's hard to wrap around what, I, what you mean by that. Sometimes the word flesh does refer to the body, but in this ethical sense, flesh seems to be referring to a tendency to sin. I've compared it to the, uh, out where we used to live near, in Idaho, there was a, a place where the Oregon Trail, you could go out there and still see the ruts that are left from the 
wagons coming out to Oregon from, from St. Louis. And uh, there's a sense in which in my old man, the person I used to be, there's some ruts of running in unrighteousness that I used to be, that used to be my way. Well, now I'm a new creature and I don't have to do that anymore, but I sometimes slip into the old ruts and that's the flesh. And Paul says he did the same thing. So, we've got two things contending with each other. In my mind, I know that I'm a child of God. I'm right with God. I have the Spirit of God. My, my body is an instrument of righteousness. But I keep getting bogged down in this principle that we won't have anymore when we don't live in this body. But as long as we live in this body, we contend with the flesh. I hope you realize what I'm saying. It's not the body, but it's a principle of sin. And his answer, when he says who will deliver me from the body of this death is <clears throat> basically thanks be to God or I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord verse 25 because some people think this is Paul talking about his former life as a non-believer maybe you think that I don't know but I'm convinced Paul is saying this is the struggle every Christian will continue to have as long as they live in a physical body. We look forward to the day that we'll be free of that struggle, but even now we can realize freedom or success in our waging of war against the flesh. And chapter 8 tells us how. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And he talks about now walking according to the uh, Spirit instead of according to the flesh. Verse 14 of chapter 8, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. These are the ones who, in other words, are showing themselves to be God's, uh, they're being like God, and therefore showing themselves to be His sons. Now all the rest that's in Romans 8, this wonderful chapter that, uh, by the way, I took a course in this very room a few years ago on the, on the book of Romans, and it was an entire week. And all we did, you know, we read through Douglas Moo's commentary, we read through Romans, and we went through it with a fine-tooth comb. We even then felt like we were going quickly, though, too quickly. So, as much as I'd like to spend time in Romans, we can't, uh, Romans 8. But he says toward the end, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And uh, the answer is no one and nothing is, is really what he says in that chapter. <clears throat> well, in, in 835, who shall separate us from the love of uh, Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Uh, <clears throat> he says in verse 38, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, that passage... Nothing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I think, in a way, that's the pinnacle of a, the heart of this book, uh, right there. It would seem to be a diversion, then, to start talking about Israel. But think about it this way. If you've just been promised that you don't just have God, He's got you. You know, and like Romans, uh, John 10, he's not going to let go of you. No one, no one can snatch you out of his hand. You might say, what about Israel? Didn't they, didn't they fail and didn't they fall and didn't they lose their uh, standing with God? And if it happened to Israel, couldn't it happen to me? And I think that's why Paul brings this discussion in at this point. Because he shows that Israel made a choice that, um, first of all, Israel was chosen by the sovereign God, but, but though Israel sinned and rejected the Messiah, that God has a plan and purpose for Israel in the future. In the meantime, uh, Israel is compared to an olive tree, a natural olive tree, uh, that's been broken off as a, as a judgment or a, as a result of sin, but it's not dead. It's going to come back from the roots like olive trees do. In the meantime, we Gentiles have been grafted in to benefit from the root stock, so to speak, of Israel. And we have many of the blessings that were promised to Abraham because we're among the nations in whom his seed was to be a blessing. But 
he brings out that um, Israel has a future. <clears throat> uh, chapter 11, I say then, God is not cast away. Has God cast away his people? Certainly not. So he's making really, an, he's using Ill, uh, Israel to illustrate the fact that just as the believer, no, no one can separate us from the love of Christ. No one can separate Israel ultimately from the uh, love promise of God either. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew, verse 2. Now, let's see, where are we on blanks? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, the key question, how do I live a life of righteousness? And the answer is by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's at the top of page 20, the key question. How do I live a life of righteousness by the power of the Holy Spirit? And then the vindication of God's righteousness, which as I say, is showing how even though Israel stumbled and fell, they are not down and out. They're down but not out. And God's got a future for them. And in a similar way, we can fail and suffer the consequences, but we can be assured that God is, in his faithfulness, will, will uh, restore us as well. The reality of his sovereignty in, in chapter 9, verses 14 through 24, the key question is, is God's choosing righteous? And the answer to that question is, you don't have a right to ask that question. That's not, I mean, that's not, that's not, God doesn't answer to you. He can choose whom he will, as a potter can choose the purpose to which he puts the clay that he molds. The key question is, is Israel what? Well, is God's choosing righteous? I realize that that doesn't quite flow with the, what I was saying about Israel a minute ago, but as an, as an example of eternal security. <clears throat> now, when we come to 12 through 15, the practice of God's righteousness. This is where we turn the corner, as Paul does in most of his epistles, and goes from being, I don't want to say theoretical, but foundational in doctrine, to now what is built on that foundation in the way of practical living. But before we look at 12... <clears throat> when chapter 11 ends by saying in 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And then he makes this quotation from the Old Testament. Uh, he finally says in 36, For of him and through him and to him are all things, to, him, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. He is now, he's gotten all the way to the end of 11. He's looking back over what he said about Israel, but also all the way back to the beginning of the epistle and about the righteousness of God being maintained, not being compromised, but being given to as a matter of grace through faith to people that don't deserve it, being imparted to people willing to walk by his spirit and being... Um, lived out now in a, in a righteous way and Paul just takes time to marvel at the sovereign God of grace. And on the basis of that, chapter 12 says, I beseech you therefore, in other words, in view of all that, all the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. <clears throat> so our living sacrifice to God is a response to to everything in Romans 1 through 11. And it's reasonable, therefore. It's, a, it's, it's simply what logically follows what he's done for us. <clears throat> We're not to be conformed to this world. I think it was J.B. Phillips who in his, his uh, paraphrase said, don't let the world uh, cram you into its mold. I like that. And you know something? Uh, this was an insight I got a number of years ago. We always talk about hypocrisy in the church. You know, a bunch of uh, 
holier than thou people that act like they're hot stuff, but actually they have problems like everybody else. But they come to church and they're so hypocritical. You know, we always talk like that. You know who's a hypocrite? It's a Christian who acts like he's still not a Christian, like he's still conformed to this world. He's basically saying, don't masquerade in the mannerisms of the world. Don't put on, don't come to the uh, masquerade party dressed up like a worldling because you ain't one. You used to be, but you're not now. And that's really hypocrisy to keep living like the person you were when you're no longer him. So he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It starts with our thoughts that you may prove that is, test by experience that God's will is good and acceptable and perfect. So that's a key transition verse, 1 and 2. Then he talks in 13, chapter 13, and there's a lot in 12, by the way, that are just, this is wonderful. It's almost like a church covenant from verses 17 through 21. Actually, even sooner than that, starting with verse 9. It's, it's just the end of chapter 12 is very practical and, and a great place to uh, look as a summary of how a Christians uh, should act and how we treat each other. So the question, the key question under this chapters 13, 14, and 15, what does a righteous life look like? And he's answering it in here. In 13, it's in relation to government. You're, you're in submission to governing authorities because you realize that there isn't any, any authority at all except from God and, and, and by his permission under his authority. The relationship to others in 14 and 15, we're not to judge a brother because... Uh, he's going to take. He's going to stand before God, and we would be taking the place of God if we tried to make Him account to us. That doesn't mean in the church that we don't have brother to sister and sister relationships of accountability, but it means we don't uh, take it on ourselves to finally judge another person. And this is in the context again of doubtful things, like First uh, Corinthians eight through ten was talking about meat offered to idols and that sort of thing. Um, he says in 21, it's good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor to do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. So very similar teaching to 1 Corinthians 8 through 10. Let's see. Chapter uh, 15 is where he talks about his refusal to uh, build on another person's foundation. As an apostle, Paul was looking for uh, places that he could take the gospel where it had not been, rather than he had a different ministry than, say, a pastor would have. Uh, but he mentions wanting to go to Rome, uh, to Spain, I should say, in verse 24. He hopes to see the Romans and so on. Um, chapter 16 is where he commends Phoebe and she is referred to as a diaconia, which is a feminine form of the word translated deacon. Some would say from this that there is the office of deaconess, that she was recognized in that capacity. Uh, certainly she is a female servant of the church. Um, the greetings that are in Romans are very interesting given the fact that uh, he had never been to Rome at this point, but he had very uh, <clears throat> very great love for people who were there, some of whom he knew, some of whom he had heard about. Um, interesting, at the end of 16, toward the end, he says, <clears throat> I want you to be wise in what is good, simple concerning evil, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Uh, interesting statement. God did crush Satan's authority under the feet of, of Christ at the cross, but in the outworking of Satan's uh, 
defeat in terms of his plan and program. God's bringing that about in history and Paul anticipated it uh, pretty much at any time. And then he has the benediction of the book after his personal greetings. That brings us to the end of uh, what I have time to talk about in terms of Romans. Uh, What questions from that book would you take us back to? Something that maybe I didn't even touch on or that's uh, particularly interesting to you or problematic. Something that might help us all understand the book better. Do you have anything? I just have a question about your blanks that you Okay. Where it, uh, underneath where it says uh, vindication of God's righteousness, the, the key question under that? Yes. Is God's choosing righteous? And in this outline, what, what the reason that follows is that this book is all about the righteousness of God. Well, how is it fair for God to have chosen some and not others? That becomes a question of God. Is God himself really righteous? How can he do that? And really, my, I'm, I'm not meaning to be uh, flippant, but the answer is that God is God. And he, he can do what he wants. And it, he's not unrighteous to have uh, conferred his favor upon one and not another. Uh, any more than a potter would be having to account to the clay for why he makes one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. So, that part of the discussion is, is really... Uh, Paul's anticipating someone's objection about all this discussion of righteousness. They say, what about God himself? He's not so righteous. Look what he did. He chose one and not, not another. And so he, I think he felt the need to, uh, to address that. Someone else? <clears throat> and the, last key was... <clears throat> the last key question, what does a righteous life look like? Which is just another way of saying that this section, 12 through 15, is really showing what some have called righteousness in shoe leather. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is how it, how it all works out. And so, that's why I was saying in chapter 12 that... Um, you know, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly affection to one another with brotherly love. Just going on there, it's like a church covenant. And uh, do you know what I mean? Do you guys have church covenants uh, in which there's sort of a summary of the way we behave toward each other? Uh, a lot of it could be taken right from this section. And I just, I guess I wouldn't want us to miss the point that all this doctrine about election and about Salvation by grace through faith and it's needed by everybody and it's imparted through the Holy Spirit has real life implications for how we conduct ourselves <clears throat> in the church and in the world. Any other blanks I didn't fill? The last one? Conclusion. Conclusion. And that's the word we've been looking for all morning. <laughs> now, here's the thing. We could, we could stay until one and do what we can with Philemon, and we're still, we're still behind on uh, Ephesians, which is an extremely important book. I apologize for taking longer with 1 Corinthians than maybe we should have. <clears throat> um, let's, let's just t- stay a little longer and do what we can with Philemon, Okay. Are you up for that? This is this where it's... Okay. Philemon, um, the historical background, Onesimus, looks like Onesimus when you write it out, but Onesimus, Philemon's escaped slave, had stolen from his master and run away to Rome. where somehow he met Paul, 
and was won to faith in Christ. And we don't know the details of that, how that all happened. Paul refers to it in Philemon chapter 10, or verse 10. According to Colossians 4.9, he, that is Philemon, was a native of Colossae. Let's make that, when I said he, Philemon, I should have said he, Onesimus. But they both were natives of Colossae. Paul sent him back to Philemon with a request that he be welcomed and forgiven. <clears throat> Paul promised to pay whatever Onesimus owed to Philemon. And it's traditionally, uh, Guthrie says that it's been supposed that Philemon was a member of the Colossian church. that he too had been saved in some way by the ministry of the Apostle Paul. So just stop there and just picture Paul is in prison and he's had an encounter with a runaway slave whom, who he leads to the Lord or, and he's sending him back to another person who he's led to the Lord, Philemon, his owner, the slave's owner. The letter, though brief and intensely personal, is quite theological in its illustration of the doctrine of Christian forgiveness. This observation lends weight to the suggestion by you Wicket that this is not so much a private letter as an apostolic letter about a personal matter. You see the difference? A personal letter would be one that I didn't intend you, for you to read. It's not your business. I, I wrote it to somebody else. This is more of, a, of an apostolic letter about a personal matter that was intended for us to read. Ellison outlines the epistle with three divisions. Paul's plea for Philemon. Paul's plea for Onesimus. And Paul's plan for himself. And this Harvey, who wrote the book about listening to the text, how, how the epistles are having this auditory effect, he has the word refresh there. Seven, <clears throat> seven verses. I'm sorry, in verses 7 and 20, the word refresh is used. And this is what we call an inclusio, or it sort of frames what comes in the middle. And same thing with the word uh, appeal in verses 8 and 10, and then the word O in verses 18 and 19. These are observations that this was constructed in a certain way as to frame the material in between those repetitions. Theological understanding, Tinney finds in Philemon all the elements of forgiveness. First of all, the offense. Never thought of that as something you had to have, right? But you do. there's nothing to forgive if you don't have an offense. Then compassion would be verse 10. Then intercession. Verses eight, uh, 10, 18, and 19. Okay, then in 18 and 19, you have the word substitution. Charge that to my account. And then in night, the next uh, verse is uh, restoration. <clears throat> and favor, uh, in verse 15, the elevation to a new relationship. So let me just, while you're writing that down, you might need me to re re uh, repeat something I've already said, but uh, you've got an offense and someone feels compassion for the offender. They intercede for them. They su substitute or offer to pay what the person is due or to tear up the IOU. And then there's restoration to favor and elevation to a new relationship. Right there you can see what a beautiful illustration this little book has of God's forgiveness of us. Not only does Paul illustrate what Christ has done for the believer, but he exemplifies the way Christians should treat one another in turn. 
So when Colossians 3.12 says, And so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, you put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness. And whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. This is the illustration of what we've been asked to do in relation to other people. On the matter of slavery, <clears throat> Guthrie's comment is insightful. And I'm going to just go ahead and read this. This epistle brings into vivid focus the whole problem of slavery in the Christian church. There is no thought of denunciation even in principle. The apostle deals with the situation as it then exists. He takes it for granted that Philemon has a claim of ownership on Onesimus and leaves the position unchallenged. So far, if we were to stop there, we wouldn't like what Guthrie wrote very well. And... Uh, Terrell, it would go back to your point about whether the church should be speaking to social issues in the world. And Guthrie would sound like we shouldn't be. But he goes on. Yet in one significant phrase, Paul transforms the character of the master-slave relationship. Onesimus is returning no longer as a slave, but as a brother beloved. It is clearly incongruous for a Christian master to own a brother in Christ. In the contemporary sense of the word, and although the existing order of society could not be immediately changed by Christianity without a revolution, the Christian master-slave relationship was transformed from within that it was bound to lead ultimately to the abolition of the system. I think that's an important statement. It's a difficult subject. Uh, why doesn't the Old Testament come out against uh, polygamy. I can't find any verses where that's really, where anyone's taken the task for it. It didn't work out too well for anybody. And Jesus cer certainly reiterates what uh, the Genesis intention, uh, God's intention was in Genesis. But we don't read uh, that. And it probably has to do with the progress of revelation and uh, the principle that God works from the inside out of his regenerate community. Uh, <clears throat> but I don't think any of us here would doubt that slavery is against God's will and purpose and that the church should be the last place anybody would find it in operation. And uh, so hopefully Guthrie's uh, statement there helps. Number three, finally, there is a model for Christian diplomacy. In Philemon, Paul appeals to a man whom he could simply order with the authority of his office as an apostle. So the blanks are diplomacy, appeals, and order. Just because we got rank doesn't mean we have to throw our weight around. And there was something to be gained by Paul appealing to this man, Philemon, so that he would choose to do the right thing. Because then that relationship that would be restored between Onesimus and Philemon would continue whether Paul was in the picture or not. And it would glorify God. The theme under Philemon is from bondage to brotherhood and appeal for forgiveness. And that's as far as we're going to go today. And so tomorrow we will just touch on a couple of things in Philemon and we'll have to play catch up uh, with Ephesians and what follows after.